We've got a fantastic speaker today. Initially, it was going to be Hector Sierra, but he can't be joining us today. So instead, we've got another ex expert on the topic, David Carvala, um, who's a member of the SWP's sister organization in the Spanish state, March 21. And he's also written extensively on Cuba ever since he went to Cuba in 1996 as part of our brigade. So I'll just hand it over to David, who will speak for about 30 minutes. And after that, we've got plenty of time of, for contributions. So make sure you have a think about what he's saying and get your contribution ready for that. So over to you, David, if you'd like to start. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Laura. Um, I was born in Finland and grew up in London, and I've been living in Catalonia for 30 years. So we're all international socialists moving around. I'm not Hector Serra, I'm afraid, who is due to be doing the meeting. So that's the first apology. I've been avidly preparing it ever since yesterday, and I slept three hours last night. So basically, I won't have too many dates and details because you never remember them anyway, and I never remember them. And if I slip into Spanish, then give me a nudge. And if I fall asleep in the middle of the meeting, well, wake me up, and I'll try and make it interesting so I don't fall asleep. Okay, um, the, the title of the meeting is Why Cuba Isn't Socialist. So it's a bit of a spoiler, really. Um, there wasn't even a question mark or anything. Uh, but at least it's not false advertising. People who come here know that we're going to say, you know, it's not socialist and, and why. Um, but that, in fact, is a, not a, a very typical position on the left. Um, and it's important to recognize uh, a couple of things. Firstly, that while saying that Cuba is not socialist, it doesn't mean we're not against the blockade. It doesn't mean we're not against American imperialism. It doesn't mean we're not against the decades and decades of ongoing attacks by the US. For example, the most, late, the most recent thing was refusing to let Cuba participate in the Summit of the Americas, when over the years there's a whole series of horrible right-wing regimes that participated no problems without, <laughs> without mentioning the, the, the American regime itself, the US regime itself. So we're against US imperialism, and in fact against Russian imperialism, we should say as well today. Um, and also recognize that this is a very sensitive question, that many people on the left, uh, beyond whatever theoretical arguments and a fact he might point out, have somewhere in their heart that Cuba is something, something to defend, not only defend, but actually to present as something non-capitalist, uh, even socialist. And so it, it's something to be sensitive with. I mean, I live in Barcelona, and that feeling is a lot stronger there than it is here. But being sensitive doesn't mean not telling the truth. I think we do need to tell the truth, and that's what I'm going to try and do today. But so I'm insisting to bear in mind all the things I say are based on the idea that we're against US imperialism, and based on the idea that in many things we will work together with people who are totally uncritical fans of Castro in the fight against the war, uh, against NATO, against racism, uh, possibly against climate change, a whole series of things. But here we have a difference. And I'll say that um, it's important to recognize, as I said, that, the, that, that Cuba is like a beacon of hope, I think, for a lot of people, especially in Latin America. I mean, imagine if you live in a country where one single family was ruling for half a century, a country where the economy is dominated by the army and by multinationals, a country where, say, they invest more in building luxury hotels than in repairing the disastrous housing or improving the agriculture, where people are going hungry. Uh, a country where they apply an austerity program, where, say, the cost of um, uh, public transport in the capital goes up by 500, 400% to five times the previous level. A country where there are no real trade unions, where there's racism, where there's sexism. And then if you protest against that, go out into the street and protest, they not only send the riot police, they send gangs of thugs with clubs to attack you. They arrest a 1,000 people. They start sending people down to prison for sentences of up to 30 years. A young LGBT guy, five years for streaming a, a protest. A, a, a trans woman in a men's prison for being on a demonstration. Those are sort of things that you say, in the face of such terrible things, of course you want to believe something like Cuba. <coughs> Except there's a problem. All of what I just described is what's been happening in Cuba for the last year and a half. So we have a problem. Um, OK, what I'm going to argue is that Cuba is not and never has been socialist. It is a state capitalist society. And 
this is not an abstract theoretical debate about words, about terminology. Because if Cuba is socialist, or has been socialist until recently, then the people who say that socialism doesn't work, basically they're right. The people who say the answer is market, more market capitalism, then you know, maybe they have a point because socialism has already failed. On the other hand, if you're clear that what has failed over these years is nothing to do with socialism, but it is a form of capitalism, then it doesn't mean you've won the argument, but at least it leaves the way open to say maybe we can win people to a socialist alternative that's a real socialist alternative. And if we understand that the Cuban state and what the Cuban government represents isn't socialism, but state capitalism, then when people protest against it, you don't support that repression. You might have more or less agreements with the people who are protesting. There might be all sorts of differences. But you don't support police repression. There is a slogan in some of the movements in Europe, which I've come to believe more and more and more, which is ACAB, or Cops are Bastards. And I refuse to put an exception for Cuban police at the end of that, just the same as I refuse to put an exception for Ukrainian police or Russian police or any other police, or in fact, the Catalan National Police Force. OK. Um, one of the points in this debate, and I've, as Laura says, I've been discussing these issues since the 1990s. One of the key differences is, in fact, it's not about the details of Cuba. One of the key issues is, what do we mean by socialism? Because for some people, socialism is the state controls production. The state plans production, but well, normally plans production. In the end, they don't really have much control over it. They normally control production. They normally plan production. And a state that historically would be allied to the USSR. And from that perspective, well, of course, Cuba yeah, fulfilled the criteria. You had state property, you had some sort of state planning, uh, and it was definitely allied to the USSR. But this vision is, has almost nothing to do with a classical vision of Marxist revolutionaries, at least. I mean, this isn't what Marx and Engels and Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg and the others were fighting for. The idea of socialism that comes in, in uh, millions of quotes about self-emancipation of the working class. It's about overthrowing capitalism as a mode of production and having a different sort of society. Not in managing one little bit of the world capitalism system in a different way. It means having a different sort of society, ultimately at a world level. OK, so as I was saying, <clears throat> this idea of state control as socialism is totally alien to what the Marxist tradition always represented. And it's important to, to bear that in mind. And it's not just about what theoreticians have said. This idea of worker self-emancipation as being the center of Marxist politics comes from the real worker struggle over the history of, I don't know, 150, 200 years. If we look at the Paris Commune in 1871, when workers took power and managed society themselves, I don't think they had state control or state planning, but it was workers' power. If you look at Russia in 1917, well, in fact, interesting, 1905 and 1917, workers' Soviets. That was workers' power. They didn't have state ownership in either in 1905 or in 1917. Maybe a year or two later they did, but that wasn't the basis of the Russian Revolution. Counts as the workers' delegates in, 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 uh, in the German Revolution, the Spanish Revolution in 1936, or very important, if we're talking about Latin America, the Cordones Industriales, the workers' commissions in Chile in the 1970s, the Shores, the workers' commissions in Iran that didn't last long because they were smashed by Khomeini with the support of the Communist Party, I should remind you. But workers' self-organization is the center, the essence of Marxist revolutionary politics. It's not about state planning. There's actually quotes about it by Lenin, but I don't have time to read quotes. And so this idea of workers' power, it doesn't depend on state imposition. It's not about bosses imposing or even about little groups trying to impose what people can say in meetings. It is also something innately international, because if a handful of people take power through some means or other, OK, that might be a step forward or not, but it doesn't have that wave. But if you think about the waves of revolution of 1917, um, of 1936, or more recently, 2011, uh, um, Tunisia, Egypt, and so on, in Barcelona, across the Spanish state, the uh, um, Indignados movement that then goes to Wall Street, Occupy, and so on. Those waves of struggle from below have an international nature. 2019, I can't remember all the, which country started, but when you have Sudan, you have Chile, you have Lebanon fighting. 
2019 that seems to be picking up again now. So those waves of struggle from below have a logic that's international. And so if we're talking about socialism, at least from our point of view, as international socialists from socialism from below, it is about workers' power from below. It's about something international. It's not just about managing a small part of a world capitalist economy in the name of, well, with a red flag on your limousine. OK. Um, so that model of um, what happened to Russia after the defeat of the 1917 revolution ended up in what Tony Cliff, the founder of the tendency that formed the SWP and the group I'm in in Marx 21 in the Spanish state, Tony Cliff called it state capitalism. So you have this handful of uh, well, small, relatively small group of top bureaucrats, and we're not talking about the office workers, top bureaucrats that run a company, a country as if it was a massive company. So USSR SA. And of course, inside the USSR, you don't have the same things you'd have in a standard market economy. Like you don't have that inside Ford, you don't have it inside Microsoft. They're all parts of a world capitalist economy and an imperialist economy, as we should, an imperialist world, as we should be aware of now. So state capitalism. So here, the concepts socialism from below as against state capitalism. Now I'll start talking about Cuba concretely. Um, Cuba was a colony of a Spanish state, the last colony of a Spanish state. Oh, well, accepting Catalonia, but that's another debate. Um, and it became independent, well, normally independent in 1898, but with massive control by the US. Uh, the US wrote sections of its constitution. It held on to the, it made, it established the, the military base in Guantanamo 120 something years ago. And that's where like Moise and Beg and other people were tortured, as, as you know, uh, not many years ago. Um, the Cuban economy was centered on sugar and also dominated by trade with the US. Uh, 70 percent of Cuban trade was with the US and with polit politically dominated by the US. Um, there was working class organization. There was a communist party. But by the 1930s, this communist party was really dominated by Russia. Uh, in, in the 20s, one of the leaders was actually influenced by Trotskyism, I don't know the details. But by the 30s, the Communist Party, from 1934 to 1939 at least, had the, the standard position of the Popular Front, which was you have to ally yourself with progressive bourgeois forces uh, against fascism. This is before Stalin pacted with Hitler, of course. Uh, so on the basis of that policy, in 1940, they supported a guy called Fulgencio Batista as president and actually formed part of his government. Uh, then Batista lost power, came back to power in 1952 through a military coup and became dictator. And so it was the dictator of Batista that was overthrown by the 1959 revolution. But of course, by this time, the Communist Party, having formed part of his government and having supported him and actually not being in favor of very radical changes, uh, was not particularly popular amongst those who wanted change in, in, in Cuba. And so there was another very important uh, current of, of opposition, which were radical nationalists. And this is where uh, Castro comes from. Radical nationalists, basically pet, middle class, petty bourgeois. Um, from here, uh, Castro led, in uh, 26th of July, 1953, led the attack on a military base at Moncada Barracks. Uh, the military it was a disaster. They were slaughtered. Well, literally, most of them were physically slaughtered and tortured. A handful of them survived to stand trial, including Castro. And in his trial, he made a long speech. He was already a fan of long speeches. And here he outlined his, his program. It was called History Will Absolve Me. And he talked about independent national development, land reform, social services, control on, on US businesses. But he wasn't talking about class struggle. He wasn't talking about socialism. He quoted Jose Marti, the historically Cuban nationalist leader. He wasn't, he wasn't quoting Marx or Lenin or any of that. He was actually not, not, not a socialist in any sense. So he was condemned to prison, but luckily he was amnestied after two years. That's actually quicker than the Catalan independence leaders. And well, anyway. Um, so, but his speech was a political success. It was translated into loads of languages. And he continued. Uh, they built then the 26th of July movement. This is where he got involved with, uh, uh, with Che Guevara and so on. They, looked, they started the other, uh, the, the, the next, what would be a successful attack in 1956. <laughs> in the Sierra Maestra, the guerrilla struggle, and so on. In, in 1959, the Batista, uh, the, no, the end of 1958, really, the Batista dictatorship fell. But I think it's, it's important to recognize that I don't think it was actually a guerrilla victory in, in a real sense, in the sense that this was a, a strategy you could apply elsewhere. Because ever since then, 
Left activists, well, for decades and decades, left activists tried to reproduce this in countries all across Latin America, and it was completely disastrous. I mean, it decimated the revolutionary left in place after place because it just doesn't work. I mean, in, in Cuba, basically, the dictatorship rotted from inside. Uh, the ruling class withdrew its support. I think even the US withdrew its support, as they did later in some, to Somoza in Nicaragua. And so there wasn't a strategy you could, you could re reproduce. And the guerrilla movement actually just occupied the space left by the dictatorship. They marched into La Habana when basically already fallen. Um, and they started applying their, or tried to apply their radical nationalist policies, starting to control businesses, uh, trying to have different reforms. But every time they tried to have a reform that affected the interests of US businesses, well, the US reacted against them. And so not by any plan of their own, because I don't think they had any intentions of really breaking from the USA, but they ended up being more and more uh, in confrontation with the USA. And then in terms of the geopolitics and interest and stuff, they end up being more and more close to the, U to the USSR. And so two years after the revolution, uh, Castro in a speech declares, well, what we did two years ago was a socialist revolution. We're building socialism. Um, and so, of course, it wasn't socialism in the sense of working class self-emancipation. It was in the sense of state control, state planning. In the 1960s, in the first uh, decade of the Cuban Revolution, there was all sorts of experiments in all sorts of different ways. Um, some of them quite interesting, some of them appalling, like the military units to aid production, which were basically labor camps where they sent uh, lots of young men, especially young gay men, uh, with the idea of curing them, I suppose, with agricultural labor. And there's some horrible, horrible quotes from Castro from this period about uh, homophobic quotes. Um, but those strategies didn't really work. And so by the early 1970s, uh, Cuba enters Comic-Con, the, the sort of the common market of the Soviet bloc. And so by this time, you start to have find uh, copycat models of the Soviet planning methods and, and economic methods in Cuba. Uh, the, the ruling party was the Communist Party of Cuba, which is reformed from the guerrillas and the leftovers of the previous Communist Party. It was formed in 1965, but their first Congress was in 1975. So I'm not sure how party democracy worked in the first 15, 16 years of, of the revolution, but anyway, they'll, I'm sure they'll have an answer. So the other point is that if before the revolution, Cuba had had 70% of its trade with the USA and was totally dependent on sugar, by the mid-1970s, had 83% of their trade was with Comic-Con and totally dependent on sugar. So they, like they'd done at the beginning of the 19th century, they changed, at uh, the beginning of the 20th century, they changed Spanish imperialism, uh, colonialism for American colonialism. Now they basically changed American colonialism for US, uh, USSR colonialism. Well, there's a very important difference is that for the USSR, Cuba wasn't I mean, they got sugar from there, but it wasn't mainly, they weren't interested in ex exploiting Cuba economically. It was much more the political value of having a supposed communist state in Latin America. So it actually subsidized Cuba massively. Uh, between one and four billion uh, dollars per year over the course of uh, the 70s and 80s. Okay, I'm gonna get, need to go a lot faster now. You gave me my extra time, didn't you? <laughs> it's just a very interesting topic. Oh, um, okay. So by the 1970s, Cuba was state capitalist. capitalist. And here we had to, need to go back into another bit of theory about the possibilities of revolution in a poor country. Um, traditionally, Marxism, uh, in the 19th century Marxism had assumed that socialism would have to come first in Euro advanced, in quotes, European countries. And then in poorer countries, they had to first go through a stage of capitalism before they could then raise the question of socialism. The 1905 revolution in Russia overturned that because you had worker Soviets in a fairly backward country. It was capitalist, as Lenin argued, but it was a fairly backward country. In the face of that, uh, there was an important debate in the Russian left. The Mensheviks said, well, basically nothing has changed. We still think the next step is a capitalist revolution, a bourgeois revolution, so the workers have to support the bourgeoisie. The Bolsheviks had a slightly more radical version of that, that the, the workers had to play an independent role, forcing the pace, but basically you established capitalism, and only later you could talk about socialism. And Trotsky, looking at the experience of 1905, said, no, if workers can take power with their Soviets, they can jump over capitalism and start building a worker state, but with a very important condition, that that then has to spread internationally to have the material basis necessary to build a real socialism. 
Uh, I don't think Lenin ever actually accepted the theory of permanent revolution, but that's exactly what the Bolsheviks did in 1917, well, after, after Lenin got back to Russia. They did fight for Soviet power and won it for a couple of years. <coughs> but the position of the Mensheviks was what's called the stages theory. Of, you know, first, you have to wait and you have to go through, through capitalism. We'll come back and see that in a while. Because the position in, in, um, in poorer countries by the post-war period and countries like Cuba, the position of the Communist Party in Cuba was, well, we have to fight firstly for capitalism, as, as bourgeois democracy, and only later can we can fight, fight for socialism, uh, which is one of the, their weaknesses. So but <laughs> what happened in Cuba, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing too much and I'm losing things. So Trotsky argued that in those poor countries, the bourgeoisie could not lead the struggle because it's too tied to imperialism. It's not like the bourgeoisie of 1640 in Britain when they cut off the king's head or in 1789 in France when they cut off the other king's head. It was too tied to imperialism, so they wouldn't lead the struggle. So it meant the working class had to lead the struggle against uh, colonialism, against imperialism, and then for socialism. Is this what happened in Cuba in 1959? Well, no, it wasn't. And what Tony Cliff did, coming back to Tony Cliff, is say, well, let's look at the reality. It wasn't the bourgeoisie. Trotsky was right. It should have been the working class. Trotsky was right in that sense, but it wasn't. So what had actually happened? Well, this layer of the middle class of Castro, lawyer, Che Guevara, doctor, and so on. If you look at anti-colonial struggles around the world, it's the same thing. Mandela, lawyer, army officers like Chavez or Nasser in Egypt. So that middle class layer that fills the vacuum left by a bourgeoisie that won't, doesn't want to fight, and a, a, root, a, 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 a working class that's often unable to fight because it's held back either by Stalinism or just by weak organization or, or other things, by the lack of that subjective factor. So this, this middle class sector replaces it and establishes what? They don't establish workers' control and socialism. They establish a sort of state capitalism. They want to advance their economy. They want to advance their country because it's shameful that we're so poor and we're so backward. We want to advance as a national force led by, well, of course, us. And this is exactly what happened in Cuba. Um, the, the, the book that Laura quoted at the end by um, a guy called Steve Cushion, he's done interesting work about the role of workers in the 1959 revolution. And it's a sort of hidden history, as the book is called. And it's something like uh, Cliff argues in his a, a very important text about Cuba and China in 1963. So, you know, workers didn't move. There wasn't, you know, the, 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 the guerrilla leaders actually said to people, you know, just carry on working as normal. We don't want strikes. We don't want and his, his speeches by Castro from 1959 trying to control the strikes. Um, and Steve, I think, is right to say there's also things happening, but even he recognized it wasn't independent workers' uh, organization fighting for workers' power. It was supporting the guerrilla struggle. It was a backup for the guerrilla struggle. And it's important to recognize those things, but you get that in all sorts of struggles. I mean, sorry to mention it, it's a recent experience of ours in Catalonia, the independence struggle. There were different strikes and workers' mobilizations, but it wasn't a workers' movement. It was a movement led by the the right-wing petty bourgeoisie and other people on the left. So it wasn't a workers' revolution. And so you had this, this uh, state capitalist regime. And how do we understand capitalism? Well, it goes into crisis, doesn't it? When the boom ends, it goes into crisis. This happened in the USSR, falling rate of profit, and then all the other things that happen. Cuba started going into crisis already in official publication in the 1980s. They're talking about what we call affording rate of profit, affording rate of return on investment. And that's in public uh, declarations. Then when the USSR goes down, well, those subsidies stop coming in, and so you have really serious crisis in the 1990s, people actually going hungry. Um, there's a certain recovery with the, um, the support they got from the Venezuela, uh, Chavez, uh, the Venezuela of Chavez, uh, but then that trickled out. So the situation now is severe crisis in Cuba. Um, I just saw photos last night, power cuts are now a regular thing, you know, people's fridges break down because, you know, power keeps power keeps going on and off. If you want chicken, if you're lucky enough, your local shop has chicken, you might be queuing up for 13 hours to buy chicken. More and more necessary goods are now only sold in shops that are in foreign currency. Well, substitute foreign currency, you have to get through the state. If you get foreign currency from your family abroad, then you have to change it to this state controlled foreign currency and then go to these special shops. Uh, they introduced the austerity plan in the beginning of 2021 with massive increases in prices. They did increase wages as well, but uh, lots of people suffered a lot for that. Uh, like uh, uh, food prices, uh, uh, the, the old people's homes where they went to eat, had to, the, the prices went up massively. There's a group called Communist Cuba that uh, explained all this in detail, a left-wing group in, inside Cuba. Um, 
All this was behind, linked also to the effects of the pandemic and no doubt effects, uh, knock-on effects of the blockade, which is a real problem as well. So the 11th of July, you had these massive protests, 11th of July, 2021, massive protests across Cuba, spontaneous protests. I mean, there was tweeting going on from the right wing of Miami. I mean, they've been tweeting for decades and decades and decades, you know, and it doesn't, you don't have protests all the time. The protest was a product of that social situation just exploded spontaneously, especially from the poorer areas, black areas, uh, lots of trans activists in the street. There's interesting quotes. Uh, I did an article that was translated into English on the ISJ website. Mm -hmm. A trans activist that says, we were on those demonstrations because of our oppression as trans activists, but also because of the poverty, because there's nothing in the shops, because if you get ill, you, know, you might be able to see a doctor, because there's lots of doctors in, in Cuba, but you can't get the medicine. All these sorts of things. So that was a real struggle from below. As a left, as I said, and I'll continue to, we are against US imperialism, we're against the blockade, etc. Between the US and Cuba, we're on the side of Cuba. But between the, US, the Cuban state, the Cuban riot police, and ordinary Cuban working class people, young black activists, young trans activists, I think nobody on the left should have the least doubt about which side they're on. And then when they're sent down for prison sentences of up to 30 years, we should have no doubt of which side we're on. Some of my helped Cuba, there was Cuban activists did a statement uh, condemning those prison sentences, which also said, of course, we're against the blockade, but we're also against these policies of the Cuban government. And it's true, they, they spent massive amounts of money on luxury hotels in the middle of the lockdown. And people's houses are falling down. Agriculture, Cuban used to have, I mean, they don't even produce sugar anymore, let alone food that people can eat. And they, instead of investing in that, they invest in, in, in luxury hotels. It's madness. Um, so for the left, as I said, we have to say which side are we on? And that question, if Cuba is socialist, then I don't know how you can possibly, uh, where, where do you place yourself? I mean, I think the only, you, you say, well, if that's socialist, I'm not a socialist anymore. But if you understand that Cuba is state capitalism in a world capitalist economy that doesn't allow you to do nice things for much, I'm sure the guerrilla leaders wanted to do nice things when they took power. But the system works like that. That's why we say you have to have international socialism from below. Not it's not some weird preference. It's because that is the only way of overcoming world capitalism. You can't do it by reforms. If they couldn't do it in the USSR, still less can you do it in an island just off the south coast of the USA. So I'll leave it for there for now. But I'm just saying it's an important debate. It's a serious debate, a lot more serious than shouting like that. <laughs> because people in Cuba are fighting on this and debating this now. We have to be in solidarity with them. And, well, I'll leave it here. Thank you. First of all, if you would like to make a contribution, please feel free to put your hand up, and I'll be calling in the speakers one by one. Now, it's really important because I'm sure we want to hear from as many people as possible to give the com uh, contributions to three minutes, and I will be strictly timing those. So it's nothing personal. If I ask you to sum up, I'll give you one minute warning, and then I'll ask you to sum up, so please do. And then just a final note, this is not really a question of politics, it's a question of manners, okay? So if someone wants to disagree, by all means, feel free to in three minutes completely you know, turn things around and say that you hated the introduction. I'm, I'm sure you won't, but... If you want to do that, that's fine, but please, please behave, or I'll have to send you to the crash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, if anyone, okay, uh, the person over there with the overalls, yeah? Yeah, there will be a microphone going around. If you could speak into the microphone for people in Zoom. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out, in Socialist Work and Newspaper, we, um, we wrote an article when the protest happened, and we entitled it um, uh, Support the Protests in Cuba, but we were US imperialism. Of course, this is exactly what David said in the meeting, and completely right. We got the, probably the most kind of abuse that we've ever, well, we've ever got, but in the last few years, um, from that article, uh, you know, and you see from that, it is an incredibly um, emotional topic for people. It's, an, it's something that comes, you know, as we've just seen, you know, um, really kind of makes people angry, and makes people cross. Um, and I think that this comes from um, something very real, and I'm sure there's going to be more meetings on Stalinism as we go through. Um, you know, it comes from, uh, I, think, I think, defeatism. 
Um, especially with young people, we haven't seen many victories in our lifetime. We've seen, um, you know, the rise of austerity and neoliberalism. You know, that's not. And I think that these small states like Cuba and then the memory of the USSR are con considered to be hope for people. Um, and they cling on to that, that. And I think that, and I think David did it, you know, perfectly. This is why we have to have these kind of debates, these very, you know, open debates about about Cuba. Um, and I also think that there, I, maybe this is slightly a question uh, about the rest of um, Latin America. On a lot of protests in Latin America, obviously we've seen brilliant ones in places like in Chile, um, and then um, really at the moment we're seeing massive protests in Ecuador as well. Um, and what you'll see on a lot of those protests is the Cuban flag. Um, you see that all the time, you see the Cuban flag, it is a symbol for them of resistance. And of course, you know, um, we, we absolutely commend these brilliant struggles on the streets. Um, but I think, again, it comes back to a slight defeatism in the idea of workers. You know, every single time, we, they got a lot of times in, sorry, a lot of times in Latin America, there's these brilliant protests, these brilliant, um, you know, mobilizations, but they often funnel back into parliamentary politics, or so-called left-wing leaders that often actually end up letting down working class people and left. going to the right, going rightwards. Um, and I think those two things are connected. Um, and I think all of the thing that connects that is a, um, a, a kind of a defeatism when we talk about the power of workers. And so I think I'd like to say that, um, you know, our tradition, I think, always puts workers first. And we're not trying to say, oh, Cuba, well, you know, not trying to wipe your finger or whatever. We're trying to say that actually the kind of socialism we have, it offer, offers so much more hope. Um, so, yeah, I'll finish that. Okay. I, yeah, um, so I just like to just just answer a bit really quick. Um, is that I definitely agree with the idea that workers control, workers democracy is essential to socialism. But one kind of criticism I would say is that that should, that's just one element of socialism. Socialism is also about uh, producing services and needs based on the needs of the planet, the needs of people, um, and also about producing a kind of decent and egalitarian society. And so in those, in those regards, I admit that in terms of democracy, you know, Cuba's kind of lacking, but in those other regards, I think Cuba's actually done uh, quite well. And I think in lots of countries, particularly in the third world, people are poorer than you know, this country. Those elements of socialism are much more important. Um, and so, and so, the, so, the, the, so in terms of like lack of democracy, the question I'd ask is, is there not important reasons why democracy isn't as developed as you'd like it to be uh, in Cuba. Because it's not just Cuba, is it? If you look through all the major revolu revolutions of the 20th century, you know, they, they've all been very poor countries where people have you know, really tried to lift people out of kind of desperate misery, brutal exploitation that they found themselves in. And everywhere, everywhere that's happened, the elites in their own societies, uh, countries like the US and Britain, have put all their resources they can into destroying it. And so we can look at the examples, you know, I'd love for a revolution to be, you know, completely decent and democratic. That should be the ideal. But if you look at the examples in history, you have the end day. The end day was crushed, it lasted about a year. You have the anarchists in Spain, they lasted a few years. Um, in Russia, the USSR, they brought in democracy uh, and it just turned into capitalism in, you know, a year or two. Uh, and that was, the, yes. it was the, the biggest collapse in life expectancy in peacetime history. Um, so, so yeah, so, so in, in that regard, I just want to say, is don't, think, don't think that they should be given more credit, um, given the situation that we're in. We can say, oh, well, they need to uh, support policy of international revolution, but I don't think there's been another government that's done more to support other revolutions yeah. around the world. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do that. So, if I could remind people, if you can indicate to speak while the person is speaking, that should be okay so I can see you better. Sorry, can you be in your seat, please? Just, oh, my seat? Uh, yeah, 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 for the contribution. Thank you. Okay, um, I entirely agree with the, with the speaker that uh, Cuba is not a socialist uh, country. A, because we cannot have a socialism in a little island with the world capitalism. And also the second question is, who controls the state in, uh, in Cuba? 
Are the workers, are the peasants, are the oppressed people in Cuba? No, it is a new sort of your ruling class camouflaged in that kind of socialism. But the point I would like to make is this, whether the Cuban revolution is a still a beacon in Latin America, I could doubt it. I think uh, there is a new wind uh, blowing in Latin America. And uh, I know Sophie said that uh, in certain huge demonstrations that it has ha uh, is happening in Latin America, one or two Cuban flags. But in reality, in Latin America, I think people learned that a guerrilla struggle is a completely useless. I think Che Guevara was an example. The man died without any shoes and with asthma in, in Bolivia. So that is a very, very powerful uh, sort of, you know, a statement to say that a group of uh, illuminated uh, intellectual will do the revolution on behalf of the working class and the peasant and the oppressed. I don't think so in Latin America is still a beacon. What's going on in Latin America are enormous uprising in any country you can think of. Uh, in my own country where I was born, there was a huge uprising. As a result of that, you do have this uh, left-wing government, the first uh, young president in the history of Chile, but I can mention, I don't know, Bolivia, Ecuador, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But those movements at the heart are, literally speaking, workers, peasants, and the oppressed in, in capitalist society. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this is the, the, the situation. I think we're going to, en we entered a new era of reformism in Latin America, because all the leaders that you can think of, the latest one, Petro, for example, in, in uh, Ecuador, he's not talking about socialism, he's not talking about replacing capitalism, what he's talking about is to reform neoliberalism. And the danger is, when this kind of reformism, in a way, paralyzed the struggle, confused the working class, and so on. So the task, really, of international socialism is to build a genuine revolutionary party, you know, Please. that is born in the heart of the working class and to challenge the system. I think that is the start internationally, and I think even in this country, the wind is blowing at the side of the worker. Mick Lynch synthesized that feeling, the that anger, time. and so on. Thank you. I think I think you're right to say that certain aspects of life for Cuban people are, are quite good. You know, some some aspects, not loads. Um, uh, but you're also right to say that it's not democratic in the slightest, and it's not doesn't have all the aspects of socialism. You say maybe there's a reason for that. I'll tell you what the reason is. In my opinion. The reason is because it's not a socialist country, as the speaker said. And that's because they didn't go through a democratic, a socialist workers' revolution, um, and they still haven't. So when we're calling for support for international revolution from Cuba, we're not calling for the state to do that. We're calling for the Cuban working class to do that. We're calling for them to reject the um, calls uh, by the US to ally, ally themselves with the US. We reject that, but we, we call for them to protest against their own government, as we do believe that it is a class society, and um, we call for them to rise up and be part of a real workers' revolution. Now, in terms of other revolutions throughout the 20th century, I mean, there are other meetings on this, um, but I think the key thing that's been missed, there, there are a few key things that we miss missing from all of them. Um, first of all, the question of internationalism. And that's really key. So when you had revolutions in the 30s, and 50s, and so on, um, in some cases, you had them being backed internationally, but very few. Most of the time, the organized left 
um, was supportive of Stalinism and was lining up behind the Sta Stalinist Russia. I refuse to kill the USSR, by the way. Um, and um, they were, because they were lining themselves up behind Stalinist Russia, um, that meant that they would subordinate their own uh, local work, real worker struggle to that international struggle. So that created a vacuum which um, meant that there couldn't be an organized working class um, you know, re revolutionary organization as part of it. Um, it also, also because uh, in some revolutions, there was no revolutionary party. Without a revolutionary party, um, which has a tradition of internationalism and worker struggle, you cannot, uh, you can have workers rising up and fighting back, and even overthrowing the state, but then what? And without a revolutionary party, again, it creates a vacuum, and other forces will step in. That's why it's really important to uh, stand in the tradition of international working, working class struggle and be part of a, work, a, a, work, a party like the Socialist Workers' Party. Thanks. Well, I, I guess I'll pick up from what my comrade, uh, previous comrade was saying, um, which is to, I, I think it's fair to value the change that Cuba brought forward, um, to value the fact that it did attempt to have a national healthcare system, and, and to also acknowledge the fact that it was sort of squashed most of the times by the Imperial West constantly. That is absolutely fair to state. However, to try and pretend that it is a sort of a hero's country when it comes to fighting the socialist fight is a massive generalization. Um, because how, like com previous comrade said, how can you have a socialist country that is not democratic? That, that is inherently, but that is paradoxical. That is impossible to state. Um, you can have a country that attempts to have some welfare, you can have a country that has socialist traits, but it is not democratic. It still has a bureaucratic layer that is ruling everyone else. Um, oh, I don't know if this turned on. Oh, oh it's back. All right. Um, hello again. Um, <laughs> uh, I got lost in my thought process. Oh, right. Um, and that bureaucratic class might have pushed forward an initial revolution or an initial reform, which also has shown not to really, not to properly work in the long run, but it never attempted to actually get the working class to rise up. It never attempted to educate, to allow the working class to create a proper revolution. So while I understand the critiques that some of the people in this room and the opinions that some of the people in this room, including the people that held up the banner, um, might have, it is an incredible generalization and an, and perpetuating an idea that is simply untrue. One minute left. Uh, that, that, there you go, that was my sum up. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. Uh, over there, then, person with a green t shirt. Yeah, just, I'll, I'll go for that. I'll try and speak to that. Yeah, is that? Yeah, so we've had this talk from, from David, give your own perspective, your idea of what Cuba is. You know, it's very similar to what the Organization of American States, what Biden and the US imperialism, and what the Miami Cowboys also say about Cuba. And I want to start, we talked about solidarity, we talked about internationalism. I want to start with a quote. Solidarity is not only a principle that is indispensable from the revolutionary classes, it is the most formidable weapon for those of us who believe in the power of the masses, I'm sure we all do. In the terrific uh, force of mobilized peoples and the inspiring struggle for justice. That was a quote from a speech delivered by Miguel Diaz Canal, the president of Cuba, to the People's Summit, obviously on remotely to the People's Summit, the alternative to the Organization of American States fraudulent summit which excluded Cuba and excluded socialism from its state. So when we talk also, to give a few figures, because I know they haven't been given, give a few figures. Firstly, $144 billion. That is the estimated 
estimated cost to Cuba of a 60-year blockade, struggling access to many products as a result of the United States, but obviously given the power of the United States imperialism, as a result, it's strangulation and denial of access to many world markets. This means that it was denied access to ventilators, vital to preventing and to alleviating suffering during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as being denied access to syringes and other vital medical supplies, which would have helped it domestically produce vaccination programs, as well as denying access to many drugs we take for granted here. One minute left. Okay, so just a few more statistics then. So we've got, in terms of, we talked about literacy, we talked about education. <laughs> education was at the forefront of Cuba's priority after the revolution. In 1958, there were 82 high schools and two unis in Cuba. After, ten years after the revolution, every Cuban child had primary school access, and 80% were enrolled in high schools. In terms of mobilization and democracy, 98%. 98% of Cuban children from 5 to 15 are part of an organization, a mass organization of school children. That is democracy, that is mass democracy. Mass democracy is also the current family code and many other constitutional referenda which allow every Cuban to have the ability to change, to adapt everything. So I will just finish with this one last quote from Nicaraguan student revolutionaries. Is it a short quote? It's a short quote. <laughs> <laughs> Cuban revolutionaries. The quote, they said yes. the Cuban cause is the Latin American cause. The Cuban revolution is the loyal interpreter of struggles and the ideas of Bolivar, Juarez, Martin, and Sandino. That was Nicaraguan student revolutionaries. That is the revolutionary line. So when the Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's go over there. Yeah, for the pusher, the side. Yeah. Okay, my name is Harsh from the online editor of Service. I want to make two. Uh, I want to make two points. First, the imperialism. Uh, the Cuban Revolution was a massive blow to U.S. imperialism, and everyone inside the. Uh, in, in, it's working now? Yeah. I want to make two points. Firstly, on imperialism. Look, the Cuban Revolution was a blow to US imperialism. And uh, there's no shilly shallying in the SWB's tradition about whose side we stand on when it comes to opposing the United States. Um, I came into politics through the war on terror and the Palestinians' first, the second intifada. And seeing an island that was standing up against the US and currently inspiring. The support against national liberation movements is incredibly important and inspiring. But supporting a Cuba's right to self-determination does not mean having to paint the regime as something it's not. And that's why I think what David was talking about in terms of the class forces in the revolution is incredibly important. Uh, workers' control is not just one element of socialism, it is the foundation of socialism. And a working class socialist revolution sees ordinary working class people set up their own democratic bodies and take power and run society from the bottom up. Now, in the Cuban Revolution, there was a debate that went on between the Sierra and the Llano. The Sierra was Castro and the guerrilla fighters, the Llano was the workers and the students and the broader social movements within the cities. And the question was which current within this movement would dominate, which was the most to change. And in the end, it was the primacy of the guerrilla movement, with the social movement playing a subordinate supporting role, which won out. And therefore, in the Cuban Revolution, you didn't see workers take power, and therefore the society that produced afterwards was not the sort of society run from, the, uh, run from the bottom up. And that leads to the question about state capitalism. This, yes, thanks. this isn't just our analysis of state capitalism, this isn't to say, ah, you know, Castro was some sort of cynic who said he was a revolutionary, then came out and said he was a state capitalist. It was about understanding that the society that they brought in was locked into a world imperialist system, and Castro and the regime didn't have a strategy of international working class revolution to try and break out of that. 
Instead, they were forced closer and closer into the Soviet camp, and the priorities of that society were shaped by inter-imperialist, uh, inter-capitalist opposition within, within the system. And what you see today in Cuba is not a society pushing through progressive reforms, so but rather a state capitalist society pushing through neoliberal reforms, and we stand with people who are protesting against that. to speak in my mind. Let's go over here next, yeah? So we'll have this contribution and another one after it. Sorry about that, but we need okay, to wrap thanks. this meeting up. People have places to be, so over to you. Okay. Um, I, I think there's tremendous... First of all, let me just say, it's a bit insulting to say that we're on the side of US imperialism on, and the OAS. We are against the blockade. Yeah. We are oh. against any military action. We're against, we're against the Cuban uh, far right that have such a big influence in US politics. So let's be clear about what side we're, we're on. Also, the Cuban revolution was a great revolution. It wasn't a workers' revolution. There was competition. It's in the, the book, one of the books, that uh, Steve Cushion's book. There was competition between the guerrillas and the workers' movement that was dominated by the Communist Party that was reformist and so on. It was the guerrillas that won. It wasn't a workers' revolution, but it carried through great reforms. That's why health and education is better than Cuba, in Cuba than the rest of Latin America, much of the global side. So we stand with the, with the Cuban revolution. But we understand it wasn't a workers' revolution, and we also see the direction it's going. I was in Cuba a few years ago. It's a beautiful place. The people are wonderful. It's a great place. But we made the mistake of going to a resort, which was jointly run by some Spanish hotel multinational, no offence to the people from the Spanish state at the front, uh, and, um, and the Cuban state. It was terrible. It was awful. The only Cubans who were allowed on the resort were the people working there. They were the nicest people there. We made friends with them. What does that reflect? That reflects Cuba's growing integration in global capitalism. The, you know, I think it's a, it's a joke to quote Diaz-Canal. Diaz-Canal is presiding over this kind of, a, kind of process. And as people say, we have to take sides. Final point, you asked, why, why is workers' democracy important? Because if you have the work, workers' democracy, that sets the pace of, of what happens in society. <laughs> We've just been remembered during the fifth anniversary of Grenfell. Now, do you think in a society where workers in the saddle were in the saddle, Grenfell would have happened at all? And even if by some mischance it did take place, do you think a workers' democracy would allow uh, the, the people who suffered from the fire to be abandoned the way the government has, uh, has abandoned them, allow all the dangers and so on in buildings that... To, to continue, it wouldn't happen, because this would be a society run by workers. That's the difference between the kind of society that we're fighting for, and not simply existing British society, but unfortunately, with all its achievements, Cuba. So now we'll hand it over back to our speaker for about 10 minutes. I'll be strict on that, so I'm just letting you know, I'll give you warnings, but over to you. Okay, thanks. I'll speak very fast. Um, first, at the end, we'll have copies of Special Bulletin in, in English, Massacre in Melilla, and the Catalan version of our normal bulletin this month is against all imperialism, um, in case anyone was doubting on that. I'll try and cover as many of the points as possible. I'll see how far I get. About living standards in Cuba, um, Alex Kalinik has already mentioned it. But already in 1958, Cuba was the third country in the whole of Latin America in living standards per person, after Venezuela and Uruguay. So it didn't start off like Haiti or something like that. Um, the subsidies from the USSR in the 1970s and 1980s would have had quite a lot to do with the increasing living standards in Cuba, alongside the goodwill. I mean, it's not the same having a government that wants to introduce reforms as a government that only wants to fill its pockets. And I've never argued that Castro only wanted, wanted to fill its pockets. About um, support for foreign revolutions, I think uh, what Cuba did in sending forces, I mean, in, in Southern Africa, obviously did help the struggle against apartheid. 
But you have to bear in mind that Cuba at that time was a close ally of the USSR, and they did nothing that would have gone against the foreign policy interests of the USSR. So they would not have sent troops to support the struggle of Solidarność, for example. Uh, I suppose some of the speakers wouldn't have supported Solidarność either. Um, on the question of um, workers' power is not o the only thing. Of course, we're for production for need, not profit for supporting the planet. But who decides what the needs are? A handful of bureaucrats? or collective workers' decision-making. I mean, that's, that's why you need workers' democracy, because the alternative is just a handful of dis people deciding on our behalf. Um, what else? Somebody said, you should give credit to what Cuba has done. I mean, it's not a question about what I give credit to or not. It's about working class people and oppressed people in Cuba have decided they've had enough. You know, they're sick of having to queue up for 13 hours to buy a chicken that the bureaucracy can eat every day. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not me saying these things. It's, I, I, I'm in touch, in daily contact, actually, with Cuban activists now. I mean, the, the quote that was read out earlier was from one of them, a worker. He's actually worked installing telephone systems on some of those uh, hotels. He knows what's going on. So it's not me that's inventing this. The invention is actually people who, 60 years on, think this is a modelic socialist revolution. Um, what else? Um, Somebody said that Cuba, that Russia went into crisis when they introduced democracy. No, the USSR was state capitalism. It went into crisis part at the same time as the whole world's economic system went into crisis in the 1970s. Took a bit longer, but it got into that same crisis, a falling rate of profit. Then the, Cuba, the Russian bureaucracy tried to respond to that. The Cuban ruling class had state monopoly in the 80s. They started introducing private capital. In the 90s, they started introducing more and more private capital. And now you have all these um, multinationals all over the place with no trade union rights at all, uh, with complete uh, right, you know, Zona Franca. I mean, they've got all laws, the sort of things that, you know, any third world country had to try and attract foreign capital. Cuba's doing that. Um, so it's not about they introduce democracy, and that's when things go wrong. Things go wrong because capitalism leads to crisis. I mean, it is ABC of Marxism. Um, what else? I mean, I, I mean, other things talking about foreign policy, actually. I mean, one of the things that annoys me a lot is uh, a university in the east of um, Cuba uh, gave a doctorate, honoris causa doctorate, to a guy called Fraga, who was uh, the founder of the Tory party in Spain, and he was a... Franco White minister, responsible for uh, executions under Franco. He was a friend of Castro, because they're both from Galicia originally. And even now, I mean, last year, they celebrated the 23rd anniversary or something of giving him this doctorate. So they're not even ashamed about it. Um, there's a statue. I mean, the, the whole thing about uh, bring down the statues, I mean, excellent stuff. In fact, the same Steve Cushion that wrote about... Um, Cuban workers actually did a thing about one of the statues. In Havana, there's a statue of a general, a nationalist general from uh, 1898, that in the 1920s slaughtered 2,000 black activists. He had a statue in Havana. It was brought down by people in 1959. It was rebuilt by the, the Cuban state in 2010. A friend of mine in Cuba wrote an article saying, this is scandalous with all Black Lives Matter bringing down statues. We should bring down this statue in Havana. He got severely criticized. I mean, he lost his job. I don't think it was because of that, but he did lose his job. Um, but the, I mean, in fact, this is serious because, I mean, many people, you know, some people here probably suffered victimization at work because of their politics. The people we're talking to in Cuba, they, they signed a statement complaining about 30 year sentences for people going on basically peaceful protests. I mean, a lot more peaceful than the protest process for sure. And people are losing their jobs. And not only that, I mean, a friend of mine was called in by the, the security agent that deals with her. And I said, what do you mean deals with her? You know, every one of these activists have at least one security agent that covers them, that knows their personal life, and knows their fam who their family are. And so it doesn't only threaten her, but it's her family could lose their job, could lose their house. Now, I'm not saying this is worse than Colombia, but this is not socialism as I understand it. People say, well, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, the comrade said about the blockade. Yes, of course. I, I think I started saying we condemn the blockade and we recognize it's a problem. But 
Why do we talk about international socialism? Because we know you cannot build socialism on an island 60 miles away, 70 miles away from a powerful imperialist body. The same thing happens with left reformists. In the elections, they promise everything. We say, look, you know, electoral politics won't bring you all that. If they win, then they get into office and they don't do a thing. And when we say, why don't you bring it? Oh, you don't understand. It's a lot more complicated than you think. So we say, you can't have socialism in one country. And they have state capitalism in one country with reforms and all sorts of other things. And then they tell you, no, you don't understand that it's not possible. Of course it's not possible. That's why we insist on workers' revolution from below as a step towards overthrowing capitalism. And it's not an abstract thing. I mean, it's a question of what side are you on? Those struggles in Cuba, for me, are part of the same struggles when people rise up in Chile, when people rise up in Lebanon, when people rise up in Sudan. We're on the same side of those people from below, and we're against the bosses, and we're against the riot police. And so I, I think for a socialist, it is not complicated, but it shouldn't be complicated. Now they're talking about introducing the market, the sectors of the state bureaucracy that think the solution is Vietnam or China. There's others, a lot less, that think the solution is just buttoning down on state control. I think as socialists, we say, no, neither of those is the answer. But to do that, you have to be clear that we're not talking about defending socialism against the restoration of capitalism. The mistake made by the left in Eastern Europe in the late 1980s, early 90s, was they tried to defend a non-existent socialism and ended up totally lost. And they ended up thinking the market was the answer. So we need an independent left. Things are starting to move in the left in Cuba. There is an independent left in Cuba that never existed, well, outside the prisons for uh, ever, really. And so I think it's important that we're in contact with them. It's important to show solidarity well, to Cuba against the blockade, of course, but also to Cuban workers on the left against the state. But above all, I think it's not about revolutionary tourism. I, I'm not attacking you, that is. It is about building where we are. Because if the RMT strike wins, that is a victory to show that workers' struggles can win. If struggles in other countries, if the Sudanese comrades advance, then that is a sign. That's the sort of way forward. And so the importance of having a clear revolutionary left that understands that there are no shortcuts, there is no magical leader that will bring you the solution, because he knows all the answers, it depends on all of us. And that in that, democracy is essential, because none of us has all the answers. We need all of us together to work together to bring together those experiences and to decide collectively how we move forward. We might make mistakes, but they'll be our mistakes and we'll learn from them collectively. And so that is the sort of politics that we defend here with the SWP, in Marx 21, and in our sister organizations in different parts of the world, some of which can be named and some of which can't. And so that's, if you're interested in that, then please join us. And even if you're not sure about what we're saying on Cuba, if you agree on the struggle from below, and the centrality of workers' organization and of fighting every form of oppression against racism, against transphobia, against women's oppression, then work with us and we'll work together and try and help build that real international revolution. That is the only answer. We've seen it looking at the world today. So all respect to Cuba, support what's been done, positive, but be clear that the only answer forward is international socialism from below. Thank you.